introduce you to Professor Harris. Uh, professor Harris is actually a professor within the MALS program. Her course, uh, Visual Arts 6310, Case Studies in Graphic Design, was taught several years ago, and I know that students within that course, because they met them after they took it, just really, really uh, adored it. Uh, Professor Harris is a multimedia artist and designer. She works in a variety of media, uh, photography, sculpture, animation, and also works on paper. She's exhibited not only locally, but internationally. Some exhibitions include PS1 MoMA, which if you have not been to PS1 MoMA, you should get yourself there because it's an amazing museum and it's amazing that she's exhibited there. Uh, Exit Art, PS122. Uh, the Ujandowski, I should have asked you this before, yeah. Ujandowski Castle, Ujandowski. Ujandowski Castle Center for Contemporary Art, and also Snug Harbor on Staten Island. She's a member of Art Attack International, working on collaborative public art projects in Berlin, Warsaw, and here in New York City. She is also a founding editor of the 108 Review, a newsletter that focused on art criticism of emerging galleries in the East Village in the 1980s. So she's recently completed two public art projects uh, with the New York City Parks Department. One is, is it still there? A, a mural uh, in the Rockaways? The Rockaway one, unfortunately, has gone down. Okay. Yeah, it was there for some years, but not Okay. And was that before <laughs> Sandy? No, it was actually right after Sandy. Right after Sandy. Yeah, okay. Part of a, like a neighborhood rescue effort after Sandy. Cool. Okay. So I was just biking by one day and saw it. It was very exciting uh, to see it, how it's worked there. Uh, that was entitled Pitch the Wave, and she did another work called Look Up uh, that was in Central Park, which celebrated 50 years of public art. A recent storytelling project, Rockaway Tales, is included in Bridging Communities Through Socially Engaged Art, edited by Alex Wexler and Vita Sabahi, uh, which just came out uh, with Rutledge University Press, or Rutledge Press, excuse me, in 2019. Uh, Professor Harris has a background as a graphic designer, which I think is what we're mostly going to be exploring today. She was the art director on 39 Clues, which was Scholastic's first multimedia project. She has won awards at the New York Book Show for cover and textbook design. She's presented material on the changing role of Black Letter, which maybe we'll find out what Black Letter is, at the American Institute of Graphic Arts Conference, this Spaces of Learning in 2016, the University and College Design Association also in 2016, and at New York University's Interactive Technology Program in 2015. She writes art criticism as well for White Hat Magazine. So I just want to thank her very much for giving her time to us today uh, to explore the semiotics of typeface. Thank you. Okay, so this image up here is um, a new treatment of the Brothers Grimm Snow White Fairy Tale. And this actually has an example of black letter type. And you can see the very calligraphic large purple T there is a good example of black letter. So black letter is often associated with uh, antiquity, with the Middle Ages, with Germany. Um, the Brothers Grimm came from Germany, so that's one reason why you see it here. This is a, a new design, which is currently being printed, and this typeface is actually a revival of the letter form. So, semiotics, semiotics of type, so why semiotics? So, type is always expressing something. Um, semiotics is the study of signs, and um, Originally, it was developed by the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure and the philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. It functions as the study of a sign composed of both a signifier and a signified concept. So in relation to typography, what we're going to talk about today is the design of the type, how the expression of a style of a typeface is, is something that has a lot of connotations. When people talk about type, typographers will talk about specific formal elements, like we'll talk about the style of the stem, or the counter, or parts of the letter form, that there really isn't any kind of vocabulary to talk about all of the other associations that come with type. Um, they all exist outside of typography. So some of these associations are intuitive, they're based upon the context, popular culture, and the historical background. Yet what's really curious is how much of this are expressions that really um, 
have to do with the history and the context or what's really being expressed by the typeface itself. And it's very possible that there's qualities in the letter forms that are still saying things, whether you're aware of them or not. Okay? So here on the left you have an example of Helvetica, uh, and on the right you have an example of black letter. So Helvetica was created in 1957, and this was a typeface that basically took over the corporate world. It was uh, post-World War II, there was a desire to have a typeface that was very clear, very rational, and this came out of the Swiss design movement, and Helvetica was the epitome of that. Whereas black letter to the right, you can see, has an awful lot of hand in it. It sort of imitates calligraphy. The shapes of the letters reflect very much how a pen would move when you inflect it in different ways. And so it's a highly expressive font. It's probably the antithesis of Helvetica. So, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was an article called The Crystal Goblet by a type designer named Beatrice Ward. And basically the whole premise of this was that printing should be invisible. So it was called Crystal Goblet because the idea was that type should just be a container. Um, the type itself shouldn't be affecting the expression. And this was an idea that a lot of modern type designers found uh, very compelling. Um, but not everyone felt that this was the best way to approach type. And also over time, it became clear that even a typeface like Helvetica, which seems so neutral, has some kind of design program, some kind of expressive nature in itself. So no typeface is ever truly neutral. You know, they're always expressive of something. So one way to talk about what type is expressing is to break it down into various general kind of approaches or categories. So here you have an example of vernacular on the left, vernacular being handwriting from the ground up, you know, the most basic form of type. And to the right you have an example of signage, signage being the sort of type you would see on streets, the kind of type that is expressive of laws out in public, very clear, very simple. But here, if you look at the example on the right, originally that sign said, curb your dog. And then somebody made an intervention, and they made it say, curb your ego. <laughs> There's a little bit of white type over the E there, so it's a little bit difficult to see there. But because of the look of that sign, you would probably never notice that it said something different than curb your dog. You're so used to just seeing superficially what it looks like and assuming you know what it's about. So this is another example of signage and vernacular where the meanings are switched up. So on the left you have a street sign that was created by hand. So the type style is really kind of funky and irregular, and yet that's the sort of sign that you would expect to be um, very much like just a typical street sign. You wouldn't expect any kind of handiwork in that sign at all. And then if you look at the sign on the right, save the domino, that was actually part of a campaign by a grassroots organization. And yet, the signage itself looks pretty slick and pretty corporate and professional. So once again, it's sort of like the style is at odds with what's behind it. This is another example along those lines. On the left, you have someone wearing a t-shirt who works for Creative Time, which is an arts organization. And yet, you can see how their signage is very strong, very kind of authoritative, doesn't necessarily look like an arts organization. And then to the right you have a sandwich board where somebody paid an awful lot of attention to the type design. And that's really kind of ironic because with the sandwich board it's usually just written on the day of and erased that same night. And you're hoping that that didn't happen here because it would be a waste of a lot of time and energy. So in playing with this idea that people react to the look of type and assume they know what it means without reading it, this is an example of a camouflage project. This was created by an art group called the Yes Men. So they created a fake version of the New York Times. This was done back in 2009. And they mimicked the look of the New York Times exactly. Um, they were really particular about how they did it. And basically all the articles here cover the news they wish they saw in the Times. So this is truly fake news. <laughs> it's the 
the actual fake news. Uh, they printed up hundreds of these and they gave them away to Union Square Park. And I'm sure a lot of people picked up this newspaper and they didn't realize until later that it was filled with things that weren't true. So it was a very good job of camouflage. And this is another example of camouflage. This was um, a project from the graphic design class where students were mimicking the style of something that existed in the real world, but changing it. Um, but changing it with a lot of precision so that if you saw it, you probably wouldn't realize that the meaning was changed. So of course, you know, billions and billions killed instead of billions and billions served. If this was up along the road, there's a good chance you wouldn't even notice that because this is something that usually you never know. So those are some just some basic examples of how you react very quickly to the look of something without really knowing what it's about. And that's something that kind of fascinates me, that something can look like one thing but really be something else. Okay. So now we go to the, the history of Black Butter. So this is an example of, of the Book of Hours. Um, this is pre-printing press. This was a book that was created circa 1420 in Belgium. So before the printing press, books were created by hand. They were incredibly expensive. They were rare. They were usually created by the Catholic Church. Um, tremendous amount of time and energy went into them. You know, so you can see how it's decorated, but if you look at the type there, you can also see how close that is to calligraphy. You know, it's very close to the way your hand would move with the nib of a pen, doing like long downward strokes, very little thin upstrokes. And then we come to the Gutenberg Bible. So the Gutenberg Bible was printed in Mainz, Germany. Um, printing press was invented by Johannes Gutenberg, and this was printed in 1456. So here you have a page of the Bible and a close-up of the style of type. So this is an early version of black letter, and you can see that it's, it's somewhat related to the kind of type style you have here. This is also a form of black letter, but this is called cursiva, which is popular in France. But this style here is called textura. So this is a very early form of black letter. So once the printing press was developed, very quickly typographers all over Europe wanted to have their own copy of the printing press, they wanted to develop their own typefaces, and it took off very quickly. So what you have here is an example of a typeface called Jensen, and this was created by Nicholas Jensen. Um, he was a, a typesetter in Venice, and this typeface was created in 1463. So he traveled to Mainz, he learned typesetting, he went back to Venice, and he developed a type style based on Roman letter forms, as opposed to black letter, letter forms. So the Roman letter forms were more open, they were rounder, they were lighter, they were based on antique Roman type. Um, so they have a very different appearance, and they were, these are considered humanist typefaces. There were a lot of typefaces that came out of Italy during the Renaissance, and this became a big movement that was in opposition to the style of the black letter. A lot of scientific texts were printed in this, um, all kinds of educational books, books created by the Catholic Church. Uh, so this was a very widespread sort of style for a learning book. But this particular typeface is Jensen. So here are some particular different examples of this Jensen typeface. So on the upper left is the original face, and then to the right is one that was created by William Morris in England called Golden Type in 1890. So William Morris wanted to imitate the very heavy type style of the original Jensen when he created this typeface. In the middle to the left you have Centaur created by Bruce Rogers, 1912 to 1914. And um, to the right of that, you have Adobe Jensen created by Robert Slimak in 1995. So with the Adobe Jensen, Slimak was taking historical typefaces and recreating them digitally, uh, trying to get some of the same effects. On the lower left, you have a typeface called Ruit by a Dutch designer and from the 1990s called Jared Norges. 
So this is also a digitally constructed font, but it's supposed to capture the quality of the 15th century Roman typefaces. And as Norgic was quoted as saying, Jensen adapted the Gothic letters to Italian fashion, making them rounder and thus created the Roman type. And then you have an example of Scala with his geometric serifs and rational, almost modular forms. Yet if you look at something like the letter A in this, you can see how it still has calligraphic origins. So this is something typesetters do. And they look really closely at a type, kit, a type um, style. They'll take a particular letter and they'll compare, like the lowercase a, and how it varies across the different varieties. So as I mentioned before, these humanist typefaces um, were really tied to letter antica, a classical mode of handwriting, with wider marble forms. And the preference for letter antica was really part of the Renaissance. It was a movement towards what was, what was rational. It was a call back to um, Greek philosophers, classical ideals. Um, there was a famous quote by uh, Protagoras, that man is the measure of all things. And some important examples of things that were created in the Renaissance were the development of perspective in oil painting, and in science, an increased reliance on observation and inductive reasoning. And this image you see here is actually a Roman type inscription. This is on Trajan's column in Rome. So this is actually very early Roman type. This is if the inscription is uh, in account of Trajan's conquests, and this was created between 106 and 113 AD. So you can see how this style just you know, came forward and continued to be propelled with many kinds of variations. So meanwhile, in Germany, <laughs> the use of black letter continued, and basically there was this dichotomy between the Roman typeface and the black letter style. Um, so the black letter is distinguished by having a dramatic difference between the thick and the thin strokes, and the diagonal serifs are very thin on the lowercase letters. It's a very distinctive, very calligraphic kind of style. This is a painting by Caspar David Friedrich. It's a cemetery in the snow. This is from 1817. And what I found really curious about this painting is how the Gothic arches seem to mimic the style of some of the letter forms. And I'm not really sure what that's about, but I think it has some of this same kind of aspirational quality. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of a curious thing to see the resemblance there. And this painting is an example of German Romanticism. So here you see four different types of black letter. Uh, textura, which was the original one as used in the Gutenberg Bible. And then you have Rotunda and Schwabacher, which were very popular uh, throughout this time from the 1500s onward. And Fractor, which became the very modern version of black letter. Here you have a, a historical analysis of the black letter letter forms. So you can see how you're starting with textura, and then gradually the letter forms are morphing over time. You have a version of Schwabacher, Fractor, and then down below you have Kanzleg and Fet Fractor. And then Dido was a modern French typeface. And I call it modern because it's classified as being part of the modern family of typefaces. It's called modern because it has um, very strong geometric construction and a, a large contrast between the thick and thin strokes. So you can see how dramatically different it is from the black letter typefaces. So in a lot of Europe, most things were being printed in typefaces like this as opposed to black letter. So this dichotomy between the two styles continued. So then you get to um, the beginning of the 20th century, and then things started to change. Um, the modernist movement was very strong. German type designers were aware of it. 
But at the same time, there was a strong nationalist movement in Germany. And so designers were moving in both directions. This is an example of a typeface created by Rudolf Koch, who is a famous German type designer. He had a very rigid idea of what type should look like, and he tied it very much to nationalistic identity. This typeface is called Wilhelm Klingspor Schrift, and this was designed by Koch in 1926. Now we're going to get into the long German words. Um, and so you can see what this actually says is German script is like a symbol of the inherent mission of the German people, who, among all civilized races, must not merely defend, but also act as a living model and example of its unique, distinctive, and nationalistic character in all manifestations of life. So here you're beginning to see how there's this ideology attached to the style. Right? This is an example of a woodcut by Rudolf Koch. Um, and this is from 1919. It's a woodcut of his army boots. And what I find really interesting about this image is the way all the little dashes that create the image look very much like the style of the type. I mean, it's really kind of seamless the way the two fit together. And there was a style in Germany of German Expressionism, which also um, was very emotive in Germany's point in time. And so I, I think there's a link up between these things happening there. Okay, simultaneously you had modern designers, and probably one of the most famous German fonts is Futura. And this was developed by Paul Renner in 1924, pre-Nazi era. It was used widely in Germany as early as 1925, used in street signage. Volkswagen still uses Futura in its advertising. IKEA used it until recently when they dumped it in favor of Verdana, and people became very upset about that. <laughs> but it, it truly is a timeless face. It's a beautiful face, and here you can see that it was used on the, the time capsule that went, went to the moon, um, which is pretty amazing. But during this time, Paul Renner had a very difficult time in Germany because he was a modern type designer. So he was very much against the use of Gothic type. And there were several reasons for this. Um, one, of, one thing was that designers at the beginning of the 20th century were motivated by the demands of international trade and also the influence of designers like Gill in England. So Gill created Gill Sands, and Gill Sands is a typeface used on the famous poster, Keep Calm and Carry On. You know, so there were a lot of modernist typefaces being created, and it was tied to movements in modern art. Um, they were influenced by the Italian futurists, um, by the Russian constructivists, the Bauhaus. You know, so there were all these ideas about clarity and having that sort of ideology about how you work with design. And at the same time, nationalism was rising up in Germany. So there was this conflict. So basically, the Nazi party um, embraced black letter, and they viewed Roman text as being degenerate. Um, they thought only traditional Gothic texts could fully express the purity of the nation. And interestingly enough, this was a view that wasn't shared by the Italian fascists. They, they didn't have to talk about typefaces. So there was actually even a debate in the Reichstag over what kind of uh, script to teach in school. Um, there was a vote held, this was in, a little bit earlier, in 1911, the legislature was responding to a petition from the General Association for Antique Script, Roman Script. They wanted Roman type to be the standard. They wanted Roman lettering taught before black letter. And they had a vote, and the vote was basically a tie, um, inconclusive. But a few years later, they actually passed a law that in the seven largest municipal academies, they would teach Roman type first. But then World War I broke out, and that was table, and then later nationalism started to rise up, so America. Anyway, back to Paul Renner. Paul Renner was arrested in 1933. Uh, he protested against the imprisonment of his teaching colleague, Ron Fischel, directly after a lecture Renner gave about the history of letter forms. And the Nazis deemed it as too sympathetic toward Roman type. So they actually saw it as that much of a threat, pretty hard to believe. 
Um, and Renner was quoted as saying, political idiocy growing more violent and malicious every day may eventually sweep the whole of Western culture to the ground with a muddy sleeve. So this is an example of a German typeface, Deutsch Schrift. And this was from um, early in the Nazi era, and this says, it is an indispensable protective weapon for Germans abroad against menacing de-Germanization. So you can see there is actually incredible um, passion about this, which is kind of hard to believe. So in 1933, Hitler declared the new typography, um, like Futura, to be un-German, and he declared Fraktur to be Volk, i.e. the people's font. And I found this image of uh, an old man who uh, works by an angel hawk wagon. I actually looked up a translation of this, and hawk is supposed to mean hook, like H-O-F, which sounds very strange. Mm -hmm. So when the Nazi party came into power, um, there were a lot of versions of fractured black letter that were developed. Uh, many different ones. Some of them were called Deutschland, National, Tannenberg, Gothenburg. And if you look at this example here, you can see the, the early textura, H and what that looked like. And then you can see the, the new version of Fractor, the 20th century nationalistic Fractor. And it's called, um, I'll try to say this, Schaffsteifel Grotesque. And basically this meant the typesetters called it jackboot grotesque. Wow. <laughs> and there were so there were a bunch of these, and they were used repeatedly. And you can see it also on the propaganda poster. So here you have some advertisements um, from that time. The one on the top left is for a theater group, and actually later at the end we'll see recent advertisements from the same theater group, and you can compare them. It's kind of interesting. Set in Fractor. And you can see how this Fractor is a little bit different from the early black letter. It's a bit more angular, it's a little bit more brutish, a little bit more emphatic. It doesn't have quite as much delicacy to it, I would say. And the example on the right is of a typeface called Tannenberg. Tannenberg was the typeface used on the Nazi uniforms. Um, here's the uh, Here's some more um, propaganda. Okay, so these examples are interesting. One on the upper left is a poster for a typeface. And the typeface was created by a German typeface called Stempel. And this is actually advertising a typeface called uh, Deutsche Anzeigenschrift. Excuse my accent, which is very good. But basically, what the poster says is posters communicate, but only when they use type that meets the people's sentiment as strongly and confidently as Deutsch and Zeitenschrift does. So, that's the message there. And you can see the same sort of fractor is used on the cover of my comic. So, this continued for some time. You know, it was widely in use. And then all of a sudden, in um, 1941, a, a declaration came out that um, the Gothic strip was outlawed by decree. Okay, so this was in the midst of the war, and it seemed kind of mysterious that this happened. And this is an example of the decree uh, signed by Martin Borman. And basically, the reason given and this is truly absurd, was that they labeled it Schwabat the Jewish. They actually completely retrenched it like, the opposite way. And they claimed that this type style was associated with the texts of Jewish bankers and the Jewish owners of printing presses. So it was fairly insane that all of a sudden they didn't want to use this. So in the readings I've done about this, it's very curious when they say what the real reasons were. So the real reasons were that it was wartime. It was incredibly expensive to have a typeface that used so much lead, so much ink. I mean, you can see how dense it is on the page. So it was completely impractical. Basically, they, they couldn't afford it. Um, 
there's a German type designer, Eric Spiegerman, who also said that basically it was a nightmare in occupied territories. They couldn't use it. If they put it for in black letter, nobody could read it. Um, people who were used to looking at it found it just too confusing. You know, um, another reason was that when they went into countries like um, French countries or Dutch countries, the type foundries didn't have any gothic fonts. They didn't have black fonts. So that was incredibly expensive for them to set it up that way. Also, if they wanted to occupy a lot of countries, they needed a font that would be good for global domination. And that wasn't black letter. Because you know, it wasn't a global font. And then finally, someone said that the, the, Ro the Roman heroic architecture of Albert Spear could now use Trajan-style inscriptions above their columns. So since the Nazis also kind of, they always sort of worshipped the Roman imperial ideology, it was easy for them to imagine they could use the Roman letters for that stuff. But I, I think it's pretty obvious when you think about it that it was really economic, that it just had to end. OK, so that brings us to today and the legacy of black letter since then. So it's very interesting because it was so closely aligned with Germany and with the Nazi party. Um, that's had a really checkered kind of um, experience since then. I mean, partly it's associated with, of course, beer, beer products. Um, Corona is the Mexican beer label, but still, you know, there's that association. I think they have strict laws about beer in Germany, which is one of the reasons too that people associate beer with German type. But then you see it in a lot of other places. Um, graffiti artists are drawn to it, and I think some of the reason is because there's a lot of hand in it. And, you know, it's, it's very expressive. You can see how people start with it, and they can embellish it in their own way. Um, like that, the A at the bottom there, you know, that sort of graffiti A, even that has certain kinds of things to it. And then, of course, you have like bands like heavy metal bands, like Motorhead, they identify with it. Of course, newspapers still use it. Maybe it's just tradition, but it's often used on mastheads. <coughs> Uh, Snoop Dogg album cover, <laughs> so it looks really great with tattoo designs. You know, you can modify it in a lot of ways. It's very popular with that. This design is from a skateboard magazine from Spain. So it's also often found in um, skateboard design and surf design magazines. And it has strong qualities that make it really pop out. So, so associated with gangs, um, right? It's commonly used by gangs. Um, it's also associated with Aryan Nation people who, you know, are part of that ideology. Maybe that's part of they're aware of the nationalist associations, um, or maybe they just instinctively are drawn to it because it seems like a typeface for outsiders. I think it's you know it's unofficial. I mean, one of the things you can say about it is it's. It's very anti-technology. You know, it, it doesn't look good on a computer screen. It's much too heavy. It looks so much like it's made by hand. I think perhaps that's the reason it's used in a more individualistic way. Anyway, this is um, this here is an example of a modern day advertisement for the theater company that we saw earlier. It's the same theater company in Berlin. And this was very interesting because I came across an article in a German newspaper called Fracture and the Psychology of Type, which was exactly what I was looking for. And this woman in Germany talked about how it was, the Germans were incredibly embarrassed about using this type of things. They won't use it. They just they won't use it anywhere. So apparently this ad campaign really stands out because no one is using it. And their ad campaign is basically made up of just these letter forms in, in Fracture. And it's the exact same factor they used back in the 1930s, which is kind of crazy. But um, it gives them a real identity. You know, the same way that Paula Sherry used very strong type for the public theater in New York. So these type designs are just like 
all this fractured black leather, that's, that's it. And this crazy symbol um, of the walking wheel. These are a couple of versions of modern day typefaces that are based on black leather. So the one on the left is called um, Bastard, but there actually was a formal black letter called Bastarda. <laughs> and this was created by Jonathan Barnbrook in 1990. And then to the right is a typeface called Vitriol, created by Margaret Chase in 1996. So there are many variants of it out there. But you could also find um, the real thing you can find these typefaces, you can still buy them. So there's actually one called Trump Deutsch. <laughs> I guess Trump is a German name. Maybe it's a common German name, I don't know. But it seems like it's available. Um, the one for Deutsch and Zeigenschrift, that's, that was the poster we saw earlier advertising by Stempel. That's the same typeface. So it's still around. Um, Tannenberg is in the middle of the bottom. You know, so Tannenberg was what was used on the uniforms. It's what's used by the theater group in Berlin. And then Deutschschrift, which we also saw examples of that from the 1930s. So that's basically it. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's sort of, um, it's an interesting kind of mix of the history and how much it's changed over time, but also what does it mean now? Like what people use it, are they aware of the associations? Um, it's obviously in flux. You could use it and not be aware of these associations, but I think that to some degree it still affects how people perceive it. So, um to ask you. I'm curious what uh, folks in the audience would like to ask Professor Harris about the semiotics of typology? Uh, of typeface, typography, excuse me. Can I have? Of course. I'm sitting over here. Um, well, you better come over here. Um, yeah. Um, so, very interesting, and I've always loved typography and typeface and things like that. I wonder what the relationship is between, because you showed the mock-up of the fake New York Times with the good news in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I always think of, I mean, yeah, this is Nazi type, right? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking. Yeah. But the Gothic type at the top of the New York Times masthead is similar in a lot of ways. I wonder if you oh, could sure. just talk about, because when I see the New York Times or, you know, the London Times or even the Frankfurt Allgemeine, which means a little bit, yeah. it doesn't have that aggressive social overtone that, you know, Potsdam and National do. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think there's differences among the versions of Black Letter as well. Like, I think that the versions, those jackboot grotesques, as they were called, are very aggressive. And they would look bizarre in a newspaper headline. Like, I, I don't think they've ever been used for that. Whereas these others sort of look more old-fashioned. They kind of... It, it seems to me that that must have been a tradition to always use them on mastheads like that. No? Um, I don't know exactly where that tradition comes from, but to me it doesn't look aggressive in that context either because you're so used to seeing that. You know, but it, it is interesting. I mean, like the German theater group, um, they don't have an aggressive image at all, and yet they're using that same factor that was used during the war. But somehow they have such a strong identity that they can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh. <laughs> um, and just the way that the, the sort of campy reproduction of Gothic kind of style types. Yeah. Um, do you um, do you think that that's tongue in cheek, or is it trying to evoke some kind of past? Um, what do you see in that? To me, that seems completely tongue-in-cheek. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think a lot of people might be drawn to the typeface and not be aware of the political history at all. I mean, that's one of the things I find so interesting about the political history, is that until I found that out, I had no idea. Um, but I think 
you, I mean, you know, you associate it with a lot of punk rock bands or tattoo art. And you could be, you're going for something kind of edgy. What's interesting, though, is like there's two sides to it, right? One side is, does it really express something in and of itself outside of context? And then the other side is the associations that people bring to it, you know? So that's why the, it, it was really interesting to read an article written by somebody who's German and said, well, people in Germany are embarrassed to use this. Because people in America would be, you know? So I guess it really varies by depending on what you know about. Can I ask you a question about Helvetica? Sure. So you said that sort of Helvetica was seen as this kind of post-war corporate, neutral, mm -hmm. you know, very much modern in the way that glass buildings are modern, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and I wondered, uh, you said that there were competitors, and I wondered if anything like out Helvetica, Helvetica. <laughs> and then I wondered if you could talk a little bit about Futura versus Helvetica. And like, how are they similar and how are they different? I think that Helvetica is such a neutral font. Like, I think it's more neutral than Futura. I think Futura looks more like an early modernist font, mm -hmm. just based on the ideas of the simplicity of the design, you know, the ideas that came out of that house, things like that. Um, but Futura, Futura was just, you know, the way it swept through the corporate world and it was used for everything. Um, now it's completely associated with that, you know? I mean, there is that wonderful movie called Helvetica, mm -hmm. and there are all these different opinions about it, and some people completely hate it because they associate it with the corporate world, you know? Or some people say it was so overused that when they were in school, the only game in town was what else could you use instead of Helvetica. I mean, if you're a designer, you spent a lot of time trying to choose it. <laughs> and I think it's probably at least 50% of any communication is the nature of the typeface. So, you know, all these things we're talking about here are partly subjective and they're nuanced, but they're, they're definitely concerns for designers. Mm -hmm. Also, in that movie, someone says that perhaps Helvetica had this perfect design program, and it was, it was the perfect end result of a certain system of thought. And I think maybe that's true because nothing's ever replaced it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there other questions at all? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so we now know that, that the um, typeface is you know, it's a sign beyond what the words that they say. Right? It signifies nationalistic control or, or whatever you might want from that. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that, right? I mean, right. anymore. And with the advent yeah. of memes and any word can go over an image, they're not thinking that. Sure. Um, do you do you think that the impact of <coughs> using a particular typeface is still there for someone to communicate? For example, the white nationalists who definitely use that particular type. Right. Certainly, probably are aware of how it was used in Nazi Germany. I would probably, say. Probably, yeah. But we might not be aware of, of that sure. anymore. And I wonder if it's a dying art to know the sign, what it can mean, and why it's used in a particular way or not. Or does it matter anymore? For example, if politics now, maybe no one cares. It's just whatever's said or written uh, or typed or <coughs> presented doesn't matter because we're far more image based. Again, the type works as an image. But you know, as culturally, it matters. Like we would notice, and I noticed, as did you in showing us, where that stuff is coming from and how it was used. Yeah. And it had to be used. But I wonder if, it, if that matters anymore. Well, I think it's, I think all these things are in flux. I yeah. think it's always changing. I mean, I think you could make beautiful tattoo designs using it. And, you know, if Trump, if Trump pulled that out, if Trump really pulled this out of his, his re-election <laughs> thing. Well, it's right? going to Roman architecture, right? Classical architecture? Yeah. The well, last week they've announced. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, that national, federally funded architecture needs to be basically uh, spear-like, uh, like fascistic. Well, that's just in the scary. last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is always tied to nationalism yeah. and control and authoritarian yeah. yeah. since Rome. 
But I think, you know, I think also for me, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's always changing, that you can't really pin it down. That depending on like who grabs it, how they use it, if they change it, it's kind of like language, you know, it's just always morphing. Um, yeah. It'll mean some things to some people and other people not at all. But if you're a designer, I think it's important to know something about those associations because that's kind of, those are the tools you're manipulating and you could be using those those connotations without being aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's as important, say, for, for educating really young people. Like philosophy in kindergarten would be great, elements of philosophy knowing how some of these things are used to communicate until you're you're not even aware that it's you're falling in line with things or it's being used to communicate a particular message. I mean yeah. I think this the right way could be taught the very youngest person to know how historically the words and the way they look have what the sign really is, is that control of the culture by controlling how the type works. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I think I think it's interesting, you know. I mean, um, the funny thing is that people are really interested in type now. And I think before the Macintosh computer, people really weren't. But since everyone is on the computer and everybody's choosing fonts, and there's a movie, I don't like how America, and people watch it. <laughs> it sounds like a little boring movie imaginable, but people watch it. And then it's really, it's really interesting, you know. So, um, but I think that all has to do with computers, so that people people are interested in it now, you know. Yeah. And so all this stuff is coming up, this yeah. cultural history. Yeah. Yeah. What's the most dominant um, uh, type base now, and what is your favorite type? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> do you hate Chronic Sans as much as other people do? <laughs> There's a video on YouTube um, all about Comic Sans, the way there's one of the that. It's a really short, it's like a parody of the Helvetica movie, but it's all about how much people hate Comic Sans. Um, the most popular one, I don't know. I couldn't really pick one for the most popular one. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think there's really one that's so overwhelming. Per person, well, there's that. Let's be yeah. I mean, personally, my favorite is Garamond. <laughs> I'm kind of an old fashioned girl. Because Garamond is just so good. I love him. We could do that. I like Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but people have opinions about type, and it's funny. It's true. So many to choose from. Does Trump. Uh, Trump's signature, uh, his towers, what fun does that? You know, I don't know. It would be interesting to find that uh, out. That's interesting. It seems like a fat Times Roman, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. No, maybe no, it's, a, it's a sans serif, right? Yeah. It's not okay. a serif, it's yeah. a sans serif. You're right. Okay. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. It's an aerial bold. It's a little fatter than that. <laughs> <laughs> and aerial is like a really cheap version of a really good sans <laughs> <laughs> Charge the <laughs> uh, if there's any no any more questions, questions, I would say that I want to thank very much okay, Professor well, Harris.